Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today, we are going to demystify a coding concept that might sound complex but is actually pretty simple. That is, dependency injection. Think of it as nothing more than passing values to a function, just like we do in everyday life, day in, day out. So let's dive in. Well, you can say that dependency injection is just a fancy way of saying passing stuff into a function. It's about giving a function or object the things it needs to work. Let's say that we want to bake a pizza and we don't want to bake it at home. We call a pizza place and tell what we want. The pizza delivery is like a function that takes your order, which are the dependencies in this case, and delivers the result, which is the pizza. So let's look at the code example. We have a function called order pizza. First, it creates a new oven by calling the new oven function. After that, it calls bake pizza method on the oven created in the last step. This way we order a pizza. The function here creates its own dependencies, which is the oven, instead of having them provided. Now let's look at another example. We have the same function order pizza, but now it takes an oven instead of creating it, creating that on its own. Now what we need to do is simply call dot bake pizza on the oven provided in the function. As you can see that this function is more flexible because now you can choose which oven to use. The oven can be a regular one, a wood fired one or some custom made one. We don't even care as long as the oven implements the bake pizza method. So as you can see that dependency injection makes the code more flexible, testable and reusable. With dependency injection, one can easily swap out dependencies for testing or use the same function in different scenarios. So let's dive into a hands-on example in Golang. Let's say that there is some message, which is obviously a string, and we want to write that message to a buffer or to a file. So for that, we have to create two different functions. The first function is write to buffer, which takes in a buffer as well as the message, and it has some logic to write that message to the buffer. The next function is write to file. That function takes a file as well as the message, and it has then some logic to write the message to the file. But as you can see that in Go, we have this function called fprintf. So fprintf takes an IO writer as well as the message. The message can be a formatted message, but we don't need to worry about that. For our case, it's just a simple message without any uh, format. So yeah, so fprintf is a function that takes a writer as well as a message and returns back n, which is an int, which is the number of bytes that were written, as well as some error that might have occurred. And as you can see that we don't need to worry about how fprintf implements things internally. We know that it takes something which is an IO writer as well as the message. And we know that if we give it the message, it will be written to the IO writer. So how do we go ahead and implement our write to buffer and write to file function? Well, now that becomes very simple. We know that buffer, which is of type pointer to bytes dot buffer implements IO writer as well as file, which is pointer to OS file also implements IO writer. So instead of like implement implementing them differently in both the functions, we would simply go ahead and call FMT dot fprintf, which takes in uh, an IO writer as well as the message. So doing that, our implementation is complete. Interfaces make everything so simple. You have two different functions with two different purposes, but now you can use a single interface function, a single function which takes in an interface to actually implement them both. And if you think about it, we don't even need to have these two different functions. We can simply call fmt.fprintf and the only condition is that the first argument should be something that implements io.writer. Let's try to implement this function now. 
So as you can see, abc.txt is an empty file. It has nothing in it. Now you can see that there is a main function. Here I'm uh, taking the input directory, which is using os.get working directory command. This will give us the current working directory. Now I will go ahead and open the file using path.join. So path.join actually builds a complete path irrespective of the underlying operating system. So it takes here, which is the current working directory as well as abc.txt, which is the file that we want to open. Also note that we would need to open this file in a read write mode. So we can read the file as well as write to the file. Also the permission should be a general permission, which is 0755. Uh, so we are giving all permissions to this file. Uh, we will also close the file using defer. So after this program ends, the file will be closed. Now I will go ahead and write to file using write to file function. And as you remember, it took the FMT dot. So it is very simple. It was very simply implemented. It was just taking in the IO writer, which in this case is the file and doing an FMT dot F print F on that. I will go ahead and run this program, go run main dot go. The program completed successfully. And as you can see, abc.txt has the message printed to it, which is the hello world message. Now let's go ahead and implement this function for bytes.buffer. For that, I will first initiate a buffer using bytes.buffer. Then I will call the function write to buffer which we implemented previously. And as you remember, it was the same function that took in an IO writer, which is buffer in this case and called fmt.fprintf on that. Now calling this function, we know that something is written to the buffer and we will simply go ahead and print it to know what was written. So if we just do fmt.println and print the message written to buffer, we can see that hello world is being written to that. So in a way, we just used a single implementation to write to two different objects here. First a file and then a buffer. Now let's think of a practical use case of this thing. Let's say that we have a database and that database can either contain a file or it can contain a buffer or it can contain a database connection. And let me tell you something, the database connection also implements the IO writer, not even the database connection, but the network interfaces, the TCP connection, the HTTP connection, they all implement the IO writer interface. So in a way you can use the same function fmt.fprintf to write to the network, or you can use it to write to the database. So just to show you a simple example. We have a file database, which has file as its underlying data store. We will write a function to create a new database, which takes in a file and creates a new database. Now in the main test function, we will just write a test to write to the file. First, we will initiate a new database and then, and then we will simply write to the database, but you can see the problem here. Let's say that we don't have a file. And in real case, we don't have a database. Let's say that we don't have an underlying database connection and we don't want to even create the connection. We just want to test the functionality that whatever we are writing to is being written to the database. What we can do is that instead of passing an os.file to the database or the underlying database connection, we can simply go ahead and pass an IO writer. At runtime or in production, that would be replaced by a database connection, but for testing purposes, that can be simply replaced by a bytes dot buffer. This will make our lives so much simpler using dependency injection, using interfaces. And let me tell you something, interfaces is the actual proper solid principles in Go. So you don't need to worry about anything else. If you know, and if you understand interfaces, you take care of dependency injection and you take care of all the solid principles. That's it for the video today. I hope you liked it and I will see you in the next one.